So our challenge, user A maybe generates a shared secret. They want to get it to user B. So then they can use symmetric key cryptography to encrypt their data. And the approach we're going to use is encrypt that shared secret with public key cryptography. We've seen public key cryptography before. We've seen RSA and Diffie-Hellman for key exchange. Uh, this approach of using symmetric key encryption to encrypt data, but using public key encryption to encrypt a secret key, is very common in practice today. And one of the reasons why we use the two, two encryption techniques is that symmetric key encryption is very fast compared to public key encryption, it's much, much faster. And we may have seen before, but I'll show again. I'll do a speed test with RSA. RSA is an example of using public key cryptography. OpenSSL does a speed test for us. It runs many encrypts, as many as it can using for 10 seconds in this case. And it will keep going. But in that case, it did 44,000 encrypts in 10 seconds. And then it actually used a private key in the first case and a public key in the second case. What's the difference with RSA? Which one's faster, using a public key or a private key? You may see the answer. Which one was faster? Which one did more per, per second? The public key. Remember with RSA, the public key, that E value, generally can be small. The D value, the private key, is usually large because that needs to be kept private and no one can guess that. The problem with a large value is that when you raise to the power and that exponent is large, there's a very long calculation. So encrypting with the public key with RSA is much faster than the private key. Encrypting with the public key well, encrypting with a private key is called signing a message. We use it to sign a message. I use my private key to sign a message. And the receiver uses my public key to verify. So the summary results say that with RSA, 1,024-bit RSA, we can do about 4,000 encrypts with a private key per second and about 68,000 encrypts with a public key per second. So on the order of thousands, tens of thousands per second. Just get the right command. Now I'll encrypt with symmetric key crypto, AES, 128-bit. And the EVP option says use my hardware, uh, my CPU to do the encrypt. Sorry, the, the hardware instructions specific for AES. We'll see the numbers at the end. It's hard to directly compare because they're encrypting a different amount of data each. But with RSA, private key about 4,000 per second, public key about 68,000 per second. With AES, we're doing, it depends upon the size, in the order of 500,000 or 500 megabytes per second. Right? It differs in the, how we use these on, on the amount of the, the length of the data we're encrypting. Or if you look at here, we're doing about 9 million encrypts per 3 seconds, or about 3 million per second with AES. With RSA, we're doing about 4,000 per second, or 60,000 uh, 60, per second. So 3 million compared to thousands. AES is thousands of times faster than RSA. It's hard to directly compare, but symmetric key encryption is much, much faster than public key crypto. Why do we care? Well, what we commonly do nowadays is to encrypt our data, which we want to do fast, we use symmetric key encryption. But to get that symmetric key, that shared secret key from A to B, we'll use public key encryption or asymmetric encryption. And that's summarized here. Asymmetric or public key encryption is generally too slow for encrypting a large amount of data. 
So there are different ways that we can use uh, public key encryption. We'll go through a couple of examples. Here's the first protocol, and it's quite simple. User A and B want to communicate. They need a shared secret key, KS. So what happens is user A sends a message to B, message 1, saying, I am user A, here's my identity, maybe it's a unique username, it's an IP address, something that identifies user A in the set of users, and sending A's public key. All right, so A says, so here's my public key, sends it to B, and the meaning of this message is, I want to communicate with you, please send me a secret key. When B gets message 1, B sends back a response. It contains the secret key, KS, but it's encrypted with the public key of A. By encrypting the secret key with the public key of A, who can decrypt that message to? Only A can decrypt message 2 because only A has the private key of A. Anything encrypted with the public key of A can only be decrypted by A, user A. So here's a simple protocol for exchanging a secret, KS, using public key encryption. Encrypt, let's say using RSA, using the public key of A. If someone intercepts the first message, nothing's encrypted, they can see the public key of A, well that's okay because it's public already, they can see the identity of A, again, that's not secret, so intercepting the first message doesn't help. And if someone intercepts the second message, they see some ciphertext, and they cannot decrypt that ciphertext because they would need the private key of A. So now we've exchanged a secret key using public key cryptography. As noted in the slide, it has a problem. It's subject to a man-in-the-middle attack. And we talked about specific man-in-the-middle attacks when we looked at Diffie-Hellman, when we uh, went through some examples. So what I want you to do now is to draw the man-in-the-middle attack, the general one, not specific to Diffie-Hellman, but draw the exchange between A and B when there's a man-in-the-middle. Let's call them I, the imposter in between A and B and see well, if you're the man in the middle, what are you going to do to perform an attack on this key exchange protocol? So spend five minutes here drawing the three nodes, A, the attacker, maybe the imposter I, and B. A and B follow the rules of this protocol, but the imposter will try and do something else to defeat the system. Try it. User A is going to send the first message, but it, then our attack, attacker is going to intercept that and modify something along the way. And when user B receives a message, it's going to send back response according to message 2. So let's see what happens. User A sends a message to B, but it's sent across the network and it's intercepted by user I, the attacker. They intercept that message. What was it? What was the original one? User A sends its public key and its identity. I know the lecture picture uses uppercase A, but I simplify and use lowercase A for both cases. Let's just to be clear before we continue, what do the users know in advance? What does user A know before it sends this message? What, I mean, they may know many things, but what's of importance for this protocol that it knows? It knows the private key of of A and its own public key. You, own, you know your own key pair. All right? So 
A nodes is PUA and PRA. Let's just make, make note of them. And similar, B knows its own key pair, but it's not used in this exchange, so we'll not write it down. A sends a message to B saying, I am A, here is my public key. But it doesn't get to B, but first user I intercepts it, maybe they uh, tap into the network somewhere, they get that packet, and now they modify that packet and send a modified packet onto B. What do they send? Remembering what we'd like to do as the attacker is to find or uh, to learn the secret key, KS. So what do they send? The public key of the attacker, the imposter I. So in addition, user I knows its own key pair. I has generated its own key pair. Anyone can generate their own key pair. And it sends a message on containing the public key of I and the identity of A. There's no need to change the identity. We're still pretending to be user A. So when B receives a message, you can think, uh, this is from user A. I'm going to send back a session key so when I communicate with user A, we're going to use that session key to decrypt and encrypt our data. So B, according to the protocol, sends back a response. Before it does that, B generates the session key, KS. just a, a random value because we're going to use that let's say for AES or for symmetric key encryption so it can be a random uh, sequence of bits KS and we cannot send that key in the clear we must encrypt it so we send encrypted using the public key of user A which we just received in the previous message, which is this sequence of bits identified here, which is PUI, in fact. We don't know it's the wrong public key. That's the problem here. And we saw this with the Diffie-Hellman man, man in the middle attack. We just trust that that first message received contains the public key of user A, but in fact it's not, it's been modified the re end result. Can the attacker decrypt this message? Encrypted with the PUI, they have PRI, so yes, they decrypt and they learn KS, the session key. And because we want A and B to still communicate using this session key, we send a message back to user A. so that they don't know anything's gone wrong. That same session key, KS, can be encrypted with the public key of A. That's known by user I because they received it in the first message. And they know KS, they encrypt it, and when A receives that, they successfully decrypt because they have PR A and learn KS. A has a session key, KS. B has a session key, KS. They think everything is okay. Now when they start to send data, so that was just the key exchange steps, then for example A sends some data to B. It's encrypted, let's say now using AES or another symmetric key algorithm and we use a secret key, KS, to encrypt that data. That's the idea of exchanging the session key 
We'll then use that for symmetric key encryption, but when we send that to user B, our attacker user I can intercept that message and they can successfully decrypt because they also know KS. A and B keep communicating using KS, the attacker can decrypt everything that they send. So we have a problem in general with public key cryptography. When we receive a public key, we need to be sure it's the right person's public key. User B received a public key and a message. They weren't, or the problem from this attack is that they don't know it's not user A's public key. Any questions about the man in the middle attack in general with public key crypto? How to do it, why it works. You got it? Okay. How can we prevent it is, the, is a good question. And that we'll cover in the next few slides or in a bit of depth. Any other questions? So how do we prevent that is the obvious thing we need to look at because we still would like to use public key crypto. So we'll look at how to prevent it or different ways. Uh, we saw that same type of attack when we looked at Diffie-Hellman in detail. The same issue arose and similarly with any public key cipher. How do we know that the public key actually belongs to that user? So what do we do? We need some form of authentication. We need a way such that when B receives that first message, it can verify that that message hasn't been modified. We need authentication. And how do we authenticate? What are some different ways to authenticate? Not just a hash, but a, a MAC is one way to authenticate. Remember, we take the message and we calculate the MAC of that message using a shared secret key, K. How do we get that shared secret key, K? So the MAC ne needs a shared secret key, but with we're ex using the public key to exchange a shared secret key. So using a MAC doesn't really help us because we would need to have a pre-exchange shared secret key, but that's what we're trying to do, exchange a, a, a shared secret key. So using a MAC doesn't help us. What do we do? Encrypt what? Encrypt the public key using what? Encrypt using the public key of B. But how do we know the public key of B? Our problem here was that B didn't know the public key of A. A sent it in the very first message saying, here, I am user A, here is my public key. So that was the very first step. A distributed its public key to B. So we can't rely on the uh, distribution of the public key like that because someone can modify it along the way. How else do we authenticate? If Macs don't work or are not helpful, hash, not just a hash, but a hash combined with what? Encrypt, an encrypted hash value with a private key as a signature. If we sign a message, we can authenticate. So what A could do is sign the message using its private key and then B could verify and use A's public key. That won't work because the problem is that we want to learn A's public key. We can't verify it if we don't have A's public key. But a more common technique used today in the internet is that this public key of A is signed by someone else someone we trust. So we have another entity that signs the public key of A saying this is the public key of A. Signed using the private key of that other entity so that when B receives that signed public key it can verify that it is the public key of A. And the signing of public keys will refer to as a, a certificate or a digital certificate. And that's what's used for secure web browsing today that a web server would have a signed public key. 
But the details of that will come up uh, towards the end of this lecture. So we'll arrive at how do we uh, solve this. Any other questions on the man in the middle attack before we move on? Our simple approach of just sending the public key doesn't work. At least if it's possible for an attacker to modify and insert messages. Of course, if we already knew each other's public key through some other means, we can still uh, use public key encryption without signed messages. And this is an example of uh, a, more, a more complicated protocol to exchange a secret, KS, down the bottom is the thing that we're exchanging, using public key cryptography. It still assumes that A and B know each other's public key. So it assumes somehow magically A knows the public key of B and indeed it is the public key of B and B knows the public key of A. Maybe they met each other privately and they uh, had a printout of their public key and they exchanged them manually. So if we have manual exchange of public keys it can work. And if we do have that manual exchange, here's one way to exchange a session key, KS. And the reason we have these four messages here is to, to confirm that there's no replay attacks, no modifications along the way. Uh, we will not go through in detail how it works. You can see the first message that A sends a message to B saying, I am A, and N1 is a nonce value. Remember, a nonce value is a number we use only once. Maybe it's a random number, a long random number. The attacker cannot guess what it would be in advance. A very low probability that the attacker can guess that value. So A chooses a random number, N1, encrypts it with the public key of B, B can decrypt because B has the private key of B. No one can see the intermediate value. No, no one can see N1 or the identity. B sends back a response just confirming and they include the same random number N1 in the response. So this is used such that someone can't replay messages. They need to be able to decrypt that to see what N1 would be. If B inter or if an attacker intercepted message one, they could not respond with message two because they would not be able to learn N1. We saw the use of nonces in the, the key distribution center as well. Similar, B generates its own random value, N2 sends that back. So these are just some authentication steps saying, are you really user A and B? If someone can send back message 2, it proves to A that it is B. Because the only person who can learn N1 is B. So the only person who can send back message 2, which contains N1, is B. So by receiving message 2, A knows it's communicating with B, not some imposter in the middle. And similar with the third message, B knows it's communicating with A. The only person who could send message 3, which contains N2, is the person who can me decrypt message 2, which contained N2. Who can decrypt message 2? User A, because user A has the private key of A. So the first three messages are just to confirm to each other you're talking to the right person, that it's not an imposter in the middle. And then the last one is the session key, KS signed using the private key of A saying this is coming from A I as user A I confirm this session key was generated by me it's encrypted with A's private key and it provides confidentiality by encrypting with B's public key no one can decrypt message 4 unless they are user B message 4 is encrypted with the public key of B Therefore, you need the private key of B to decrypt. 
and B knows it comes from A because it's signed with the private key of A and the only person who can sign with the private key of A is user A. So this is just one way to exchange a session key, KS, and uh, the first three steps are for A and B to verify they're talking to the right person, authentication. But still, it doesn't solve our previous problem of how do we get a public key from A to B and vice versa. Because this scheme assumes that A knows P's pub public key and assumes that B knows A's public key. So we still have that problem that we saw with the men in the middle attack. So we'll not look at the attacks on this scheme, it's just one example of how we can uh, confidentially and with authentication exchange a secret key. But what we want to look at is how do we stop someone changing public keys? How do we be sure that the public key we get is indeed of that person? In the homework, I think you generated your own keys, is that right? Your public and private key pair and sent some information to me, submitted some information. You generated your own public and private key. I think you used my public key to do one of the steps. Where did you get my public key from? Can anyone remember the homework from a few weeks ago? My public key was on the website, I think. You downloaded a file which contained my public key. How do you know it was my public key? See, you downloaded from a website. Did you confirm it was my public key? Well, no. You just trusted it was. What could have happened, maybe I posted my public key on the website. When you access the website, you download a file an attacker in the middle between the web server and your computer received that message as you downloaded the file, modified it along the way and sent their public key to you. So that would have been a man in the middle attack and that would have been possible in that case because my public key was distributed with no form of authentication. So that's the problem that we have. How do we distribute public keys now? Posting on a website is not sufficient if we want true security. So that's what we're going to look at. How do we distribute public keys? And once we know that, we'll see why the, the man in the middle attack can be uh, prevented. Any suggestions? What would you do next homework if I put my public key on the website? Check with your friend. But what if the attacker attacked your friend as well? <laughs> check with multiple people, but what if the attacker is intercepting everything from that website? Or even worse, the attacker, the attacker put their, web, their public key on the website. Check the MD5 hash, so use some form of authentication as well. What if the attacker changed that on the website as well? Right, so we have this problem of come, come to the actual user and check. Maybe I, on the office door I print out my public key. After you download it, you bring your laptop or your phone and you compare, maybe not the entire value, but a signature of the value and compare, oh yeah, they, they match, that must be his, because it's unlikely someone's going to replace the piece of paper in my office. But that manual checking is something we want to avoid in a network. We want to do that automatically somehow. <coughs> 